Hey everybody, so after a gap of several months, uh, the podcast is back. We've renamed it the Damo Mitchell Podcast because, well, I'm in every single episode. <laughs> Whether I've got other guests on with me or not, I'm always there. Um, and we've relocated the studio to Bali, Indonesia. So here, this place, um, where we'll be running the podcast from, is actually, uh, well, upstairs is the main training hall for Negong in Ubud um, and this is the floor underneath which is a podcast studio and then if you could see over there off the camera there's a large training space which will be where I do uh, private classes for seniors um, within the school as well so it's been a it's been a huge uh, change uh, to my lifestyle um, and also to the school that I run in general I suppose because previously before uh, the COVID two years off I was running workshops um, in different places across Europe and America, um, whereas now I've relocated here to Bali, I'm moving into more of a less of a workshop teacher and more of a full-time school teacher. Uh, so myself and seven other teachers, or eight, <laughs> something like that, a bunch of us anyway, are basically living here in Ubud for the majority of the year, I think about, it's about nine months every year, and teaching uh, from this school. So we're gonna be uh, working with people uh, most of most of which, most of the students coming here, we've known for a long time already. They're existing members of the school, but we're going to be working with them in arts like Negong and Tai Chi and uh, Chinese medicine, eventually, eventually Bagua, but that's kind of a phase two. You know, but just kind of working on this, uh, these arts in a kind of traditional uh, way of training. So quite a shift um, for me. It's quite an adjustment to go from a, a traveling workshop teacher through to um, what is essentially mostly a full-time uh, instructor of the martial arts and, and internal arts um, here in this little exotic town. It's actually quite cool because after, you know, it's been nearly 20 years or something like that of spending huge proportions of my life in Asia studying these arts, um, it's nice to actually have uh, the chance to bring um, a large number of people from my school over to this part of the world. You know, previously I've been coming over here, learning something and bringing it back to Europe or to America. But now, once I'm tired of travel, now I'm tired of traveling, I can start to bring the people over to this part of the world as well. It's also easier for me because I live closer to my teachers, um, which is nice. It makes it a lot more convenient for me to go and visit them rather than uh, flying in and out of Europe all the time. So this is it. This is where I am. This is where I'll be. And this is the new podcast. This episode is just an introduction. That's all, nothing more. And just a little bit of a an sort of keep people up to date on what's changing for me and changing for the school. So if you're not interested in such things, this may be an episode you might want to skip. So the podcast, before we start chatting about anything else, um, is going to be sometimes me talking like it was during COVID, me talking on my own. But then sometimes I'll have guests, for example, the second episode and the third episode already recorded. We did them in a funny order where I have guests uh, with me. And increasingly that's what's going to happen. I'm gonna have people sat here in the hot seat or vice versa, switch around and I'll be chatting with them. Um, that was originally the aim for the other podcasts. Funnily enough, if you ever watch the Scholar Sage podcast um, on those nice leather Chesterfields that I, I miss, although I, I like my new companion. But if you, if you ever watch that podcast, um, there was two seats, right? <laughs> two sets of mics. And originally it was designed to have guests, but then COVID came, nobody could travel, there was lockdown and I didn't have any guests. That's why it became a kind of monologue. Um, so that will change, that will change. I wanna have conversations with people, sometimes with people I agree with, sometimes I don't agree with, um, but hopefully it will all be pleasant and fruitful discussions uh, with them, yeah? So we don't have the best equipment yet. Uh, the sound equipment's not here, hence the reason I'm just using one of these little clip-on mics, the Valio mics, I think they're called. Um, and we don't have the proper lighting here or anything yet. So um, for the first few episodes, you'll have to excuse me. Um, it's a little amateurish, but after that, we have equipment being delivered. So we have proper sound equipment, proper film equipment. So the quality will go up. I know the sound quality was sometimes dodgy on some of those other podcast episodes. So we'll improve that. We'll increase and it'll be a lot better. But unfortunately, I haven't had time to do that yet because, um, well, if you could see the other floors, they're basically a semi-building site. <laughs> Still a lot of work going on. As soon as they're finished and the school is ready, then I'll give you guys a, a guided tour because um, I'm quite proud. I know pride is a sin, isn't it? But quite proud of 
what we've managed to build here and um, I've had some great help from some people here both Westerners and Balinese have been helping me put this project together so yeah good times good times are ahead I guess another major change for me as well came during the the COVID period during that two-year period where it was downtime and I almost feel bad talking about this because I know it was a very difficult time for a lot of people even here in in Bali like the the tourist economy was destroyed um, and I'm just seeing the Balinese starting to pick themselves up um, a, a little bit, sort of repair things, but it's not been easy. And not been easy for many people around the world, not just for their financial, but for their mental health as well. But I will say that for cultivators or serious practitioners, like I would class myself as one of those, I, I suppose. I guess I'm serious. I don't know. Can you be serious when you've got a neon pink sign behind you, like some kind of cocktails and dreams throwback? I'm not sure. But I think for serious practitioners, um, those two years were kind of a mixed bag, you know, because there was a lot of bad things going on, business was difficult and things like this. But actually, for cultivation, it was very, very good. And during these two years, I pretty much, for about 18 months of it, I guess, managed to get the time away from teaching and, and traveling, which was huge. Um, of flying around to teach workshops to really focus on what I was doing. So I had a huge amount of time for practice, very little responsibility to students. So I was still teaching online. But still, like teaching online over Zoom is very different from teaching in person. It's not, it's less work, <laughs> I'll be honest, because there's no, there's less in the way of sort of, uh, well, for want of a better term, chi exchange. You're not giving anything out in that way. You're just simply demonstrating and talking to a camera. It, it's much less work intensive, labor intensive. And also I wasn't traveling because my previous life was fly here, teach four days, fly here, teach two days, fly home, try to rest and recover as best you can, do your own practice, fly here, teach burger, then go see your own teacher and then try to, it was manic. You're, you're basically living between teaching and, and training and, but it's still, all that lifestyle takes away from what you're doing. Not that I'm complaining, I've enjoyed it, but it's definitely detrimental to practice. In some ways, teaching is the best thing for your practice. In other ways, teaching is the worst thing <laughs> for your practice because all of a sudden, you're responsible for a lot of other people. So during that period of COVID, I got to really focus on what I was doing. And what I did was, this is going to sound odd, I pretty much dropped most of what I do and focused almost solely on meditation. My meditation practice combined with um, chi building exercises so that I could build enough chi to sustain the kind of intense schedule that I built for my meditation practice. That's really what I was doing. So I was just building chi and then burning it up, if you like, through very intense meditative training, you know, hours and hours every day. And most of my other arts fell away a little bit. So I allowed my tai chi and my bagua to get a little rusty. I don't mind admitting. I just ran through the forms sometimes, but not much else. And I allowed lots of my qigong to become a little rusty as well. And I just focused on those two things, building qi and meditation. Because I know that meditation specifically, as in to enter into jhana and, and things like this, or even the alchemical training from the Taoist lines, takes a level of mental space that is very difficult during normal life. So because normal life all of a sudden was upended, that's what I focused on. And during this time, I went deeper than I have done before. I mean, it's all still within the realms of my own amateur attempts at becoming a meditation master, of course. But for me, it was, um, you know, it was a step up in uh, skill and, and, and a, an experience. And, you know, all of these words are inadequate, but uh, also enabled me to kind of really confront parts of my nature and what I wanted and what I was doing and, and my understanding of these arts and my connection to them. It was a transformational period. I went through one of those periods in the middle while everyone else was having a meltdown about COVID, I guess. I was having my own kind of rejigging, I would call it. I felt good, but it was definitely a reorientation. As I kind of came to terms with who I was and how I was interacting with the world as a result of the change I was going through. So it was a real um, interesting period. Not always that easy, to be totally honest, but that's all right. Like it's all part of the journey. So yeah, it was a beneficial time. During this time, what I realized was that the arts, the lineages and the traditions as I was involved in weren't really serving me anymore. They weren't serving my purposes. And that's something I want to talk about because it's caused a little bit of controversy um, recently. 
when I've kind of hinted at this on social media or things I've said to people, even conversations with my own students, is that my understanding and approach to traditions has changed. So as a little background, but very brief, because I don't really like talking about those kind of things particularly, is, is I uh, came from, as you know, a traditional Japanese martial arts background, training with Westerners and Japanese in their arts, um, and then from there transitioned into Chinese art, specifically Tai Chi and Qigong first, and then it branched out into alchemy and then deeper into Chan meditation as well. And, and kind of exploring the plethora of art somewhere in there was Chinese medicine. Don't know where that popped up, but I studied that too. So just really exploring it. And as a part of this, I really became involved in a couple of lineages, specifically the one that I'm probably better known for by the people who study with me, um, which was the Taoist lines or the Chanjin um, line, specifically uh, Longmen Pai that I became involved in. So during this time, I got very um, obsessed by getting into this tradition. Now, initially, I did the same as many other people did, that I just wanted to study what I can about it. So with the teacher called Wang Haitao, for example, I studied study alchemy, but also some of the ritualistic things. And somewhere, there's a skeleton in my closet, there was a period where I donned the <laughs> nylon blue robes um, and so on that you often associate with the Taoist arts. Um, especially while I was in China studying in various places on a couple of mountains and in some schools um, and kind of embroiled myself in that side of Taoist work. Now all of that stuff always felt uncomfortable to me because it's not me. It's not me. It's just not me. I'm not a ritualistic guy. I'm irreverent. That is my nature. My nature is to be irreverent and I'm not particularly enamored, never was with Chinese culture or art either. Now I'll tell you why. It's because I grew up around it. So right from when I was a kid, my parents and my family, my uncle, people like this, loved Chinese art. Um, so we always had Japanese um, characters, calligraphy around us and Zen art, and then Chinese art and Chinese dragons and all of these different things. You know, There was a fascination with Chinese culture, that, and, uh, Asian culture, sorry, Japanese as well. So when I was young, I was actually enamored by that too. I was very caught up in it. I love the stories of the samurais and the kung fu masters. I was never much into Bruce Lee. I was more into the kind of, the sort of stories of the immortals and the saints were what you could get hold of in the 80s. Anyway, it was difficult, but that really enamored. I was really sort of caught up with it. Then as I got older, I went off it. I just realized it wasn't me. And the funny thing is that Chinese culture and Eastern culture, I always became, almost became immune to by a certain age, like it wasn't exotic to me. Like I didn't think it is for many people. I think many people in the West, Chinese and Asian culture is exotic, so it has a kind of excitement to it. Um, and I get it, I really do, but I kind of went through that phase when I was a kid. And as I got older, I was kind of bored of it. Like it didn't interest me. I was actually far more interested, to be perfectly honest, in the artwork and ethos of sort of 1950s America. Actually, that's much more appealing to me. There's a part of the reason why I love travel in America and those states down in the sort of Southwest, isn't it? Where they sort of, even Vegas and that, that sort of tacky 1950s artwork kind of, yeah, that all really interests me. That's more to my taste, hence the neon and things like this, I guess, rather than Chinese art. Now, sometimes people have hit me with this going, oh, the flamingos, Miami style, and, it, and people have hit this sort of block with trying to understand me, is they think that there's something wrong with me. You can tell in the way they write. Like, I'm, you, you're supposed to be into spiritual stuff. Why don't you play the guchin? Why don't you do the tea ceremony? Why don't you um, sort of bang the gong and do the rituals and have the artwork? Why doesn't this look like I'm in a Zen sort of meditation hut? The reason is I just don't like it. I don't believe that those things make much difference to your practice. I really don't. Now that's not to put down people who are interested in that because I have students that play the Gucci and I think. I think so. I definitely have students that are into tea ceremonies and I have students that like to dress a certain way and, and, and make their house look like a Chinese restaurant. That's all well and good. That's great. But it's just not me. I don't like it. To me it's just preference and because Asian art and culture doesn't have an exoticness to me. I'm not really interested in it particularly. So I kind of hit this wall during the kind of early stages of my study with Taoism and also with Qigong, with teachers like Shen Hongzun and stuff like this, where, who, who wasn't Taoist specifically, but still, you know, Chinese and very up in, caught up in that culture. So I just hit this wall where I just didn't like it. I just wanted to break away from it. But 
I loved the practices. The practices are always really important to me. Now, some people will say you need the culture to understand the art. And I get that. You know, I do understand. And I spent many years in China, many, many years in China, many years in Southeast Asia, other places too. I do believe you need to understand the culture to understand the art. I think so. But I don't believe the culture is what people think it is. I think to me, or what I have found most useful is the culture is understanding the mindset and the way of thinking and the view of the world that was formulated as best as we ever can know by the people that created these arts. I don't believe it's the tea ceremony and the guchin and the, the calligraphy on the wall and all those kind of things. I don't believe those are the culture. Or from what I see, the embracing of that side of the culture never seems to help people understand the arts. What it seems to do is take them off down a different route that becomes a little irrelevant. They end up studying the kind of history or the art of something for the sake of it and miss out on the practice and definitely doesn't affect their skill level. Whereas if you can understand the mindset on a sort of deeper level or of the practitioners who came up with these arts, I think that's a greater way to understand the culture in a way that's useful for the practice. Now maybe some people say they can get into the mindset of these practitioners through the tea ceremony or through calligraphy or through the whatever, music or whatever. Okay, great. Maybe you can, but I couldn't. I couldn't. That wasn't my way to access it. My way to access it was spending time around those cultures and learning about how the people think, not about how they express themselves through the trimmings or the outer dressings of their culture, you know. So I think um, for that reason, I was never much interested in that side of it, or not once I get to a certain age. So that pulled me naturally away from the kind of ritualistic sides of it. And I was very clear with my teachers. I said to them, that the various ones I study with, what I'm interested in is your practice. Okay, I want the core of what you do. The alchemy, the meditation, the energy work, that's really fascinating. The other stuff I don't care about. And just <laughs> despite some periods where they'd really resisted and tried to teach me some other aspects of their culture, I'm particularly thinking of a couple of very embarrassing Guccian sessions where I think they'd never met anybody with as little talent for the stringed instrument of the Guccian as me. It was almost like, uh, when they watched me, once they'd seen how bad I was at that, then <laughs> I got my way and I studied the arts. I really wanted just to study the core of what they were doing. This kind of sums up my nature in a bit. Like, I think my character is a mix of irreverence and liking to poke fun at things, never in a malicious way, but I like to stir and prod and poke see what's underneath that thing, you know, give you a poke, see what you do, okay, that's what that is. But then the other side of my nature is also to strip away those things that I don't believe are directly helpful to what I'm doing and then pursue the core of a path. I'm not a digressor and I'm not someone who's easily distracted and I'm also a workhorse. I think most people that would know me um, would agree that I probably work harder than the vast majority of people that they've met on these arts. It's like my OCD and my obsessiveness is piled into these practices, but I don't pile it into the trimmings. So again, if other people want to study those, that's great, but that's just not who I am. It's not who I am. Now, what I've encountered is that people who do study those, what I would consider periphery, peripheral practices and peripheral aspects of the arts often get very grumpy with me, like I'm some kind of I don't know what you'd call it, pariah within the arts, or I shouldn't really be doing this. And um, I find that very funny. Like, I find that very strange that people can't just leave you to do what you want to do. So I'm not speaking about out against these practices because I want to convince other people not to do them. Not at all. Like I said, some of my students are really into the tea ceremony. I'd rather drink, you know, cocktails, but that's their thing, you know. But I want people just to understand that that's not who I am and not what I do. So if people are going to come study with me, they're not going to get those things. So if people want the wider culture and the wider arts or whatever you want to call it, you're not going to get those from me. So don't train with me. But if you're someone who's not interested in those things and the core of just the alchemy, the meditation and the exercises, the system interests you, then I'm probably a good bet, to be perfectly honest, because that's also where my heart lay. And you have to choose the teacher that suits you. I'll never train you as a priest. I'll never train you as a, whatever, a musician or a tea. Or, I'm not going to talk about those things. I'll never act like I'm Chinese. I'm English. If 
from the south of England, and I, I, that's who I am. I'm a stinking working class Brit, so that is always going to come across in who I am. I'm really sorry. I cannot pretend to be something else. I even had like people, while I was learning to teach, trying to convince me to act a certain way. You know, it was almost like they were mentoring me, and they're like, well, you know, if you act a little bit more like this, and you have this boundary and this border and this front, and often what they were trying to tell me to do was act Chinese. That was really what it came down to. Like I was trying to be the sort of stereo, mm, stroke my beard and sit like this while I talk or whatever people do. Like it, it just wasn't me. You know, it's not who I am. So that really kind of brings me through to where I was in um, during the lockdown period is I was talking to my teachers a lot and I actually got to visit a couple of times during lockdown. I was very lucky. There was a couple of breaks in the lockdowns where I got to go and see them. And interesting sort of chatting and talking with them was more and more as I went into these arts, more and more of my connection to the tradition fell away. So I had less interest in Buddhism, like it's just faded, less interest in Taoism and Hindu, I just don't care. It's like it broke down more and more. So even in, instead of the kind of the trimmings and the lineage and the tea ceremony and the, the fancy robes that everyone likes, that had already gone. But now I literally have no interest in connection to those particular traditions at all. It's, I went to Bhutan, I visited the sort of Buddhism there and spoke to and got the chance to listen to the Lamas and see what they were doing. Um, and, you know, alongside that, that Vajrayana branch, I've had experience with the Taoist branch, been in India and sort of seen how it kind of works in the yogic lines. And while it's all very fascinating and interesting, it's just not for me. More of that has fallen away too. And it especially came after a, a very long meditation where essentially, as strange as it may sound to some of you, that I was practicing um, a very, very simple technique, actually. I was just kind of got, just simple. It's like I wasn't doing anything complicated. I simply sat um, during a particularly quiet period um, focusing on, on practicing concentration, stabilization of concentration. And originally in that practice session, I thought it was going to be crap. You know, you have those days where you just, oh, yeah, I'm going to be rubbish at everything today. Oh, well, I'll go and be crap. <laughs> that was kind of that, I remember that thought process. So I went and sat down and I thought, well, I won't do anything complicated. I would just sit and I would just, uh, for a short while, half hour, an hour, I'll just practice my concentration. And then I hit, uh, I don't want to say an experience because an experience is a bad word to me. An experience means it's done, it's gone. It's something stored in the memory ready. But I reached a state in that meditation that was transformative for me. And I was kind of caught up in it for a very, very long time. Um, and then once I sort of came to, for want of a better word, and came out of that meditation, um, out of that jhanic state, a lot of time had passed. I'd gone all the way through the entire cycle of a day and then gone into the next day. I was very bewildered. It was almost like being jet lagged uh, when I came out of it. And some of you hearing this won't believe it, and that's okay, but I'm, I can't shy away from the truth particularly. I, can't, I don't want to do that anymore. I, I've oftentimes in the past... I've been diplomatic in the name of not sort of shaking the apple cart, I think is the saying. Did I make that saying up? Is that a real saying? I don't know. Shaking the apple cart too much. You know, I just wanted to sort of be as amicable as I could with people, but I'm kind of tired of it. So I have to tell the truth is during that period, I sat and it was a, a full day had passed. Basically, I'd gone from night through to the next day, past that night into the next day again. So it was very disorientating. But when I came out of it, really... All of the attachments to all of those traditions had gone. And this was why I had to sit and tell my teacher, like, I don't know where I am anymore. Do you know what I mean? I, I don't feel any affinity with Taoism. I don't feel any affinity with Buddhism or anything, like any tradition. I don't feel a desire to be a part of this lineage or that tradition or to hold this art. Like, previously, I'd had this mindset of, like, almost like a museum curator, like I was holding on to this tradition. And I had to learn it as best as I can to pass it on, minus the Guchin. But all of that had gone as well, like completely gone. It had broken down. So I was almost like purposeless, I guess. And what I came to realize was all of my clinging to all of that black and whiteness of the tradition and the, the dogmatic obsession of <clears throat> maintaining the traditional nature and the pure nature of these arts had become not only a raft I was clinging to, but also something that some wounded part of me felt it had to belong to 
um, yeah, it wasn't healthy. It wasn't in a healthy way. I was caught up in dogma, maybe less dogma than some others, I would say, if I have to give myself some credit, but still to a certain degree. And after that, particularly that sit, and then increasingly some meditation afterwards, is I feel that that breakdown has come, that it's just not, not breakdown. You know, that breakdown of my connection to those things has gone, so that I feel a lot more free. And what I've come to realize is that Actually, my journey now lay a little separate from the tradition. And speaking to my teachers, they were very supportive of this. Very, very supportive of this. They were congratulatory on the outcomes and the effects and believed me to be going in the right way. That's very important to me because these days, whatever you say, you get negativity. I'm sure I get negativity under this video from people who watch it who don't like what I'm saying. Um, and that's okay, it's fine, because I don't really care. But if ever my teachers critique me, that's a big deal. You know, that's something that is hard for me. Well, not, not critique in like a correct me way, but if they were really negative or down on what I was doing, I would stop. Those are the people I listen to, because they're the people whose opinions I really care about. So I was very nervous when I started to speak to them about this. Like, I think I'm actually out of those things. Even just, I feel like the claws, the hooks of those traditions are out of me. Um, and I was nervous telling them, but no, they were very positive, which was a, a big deal to me, a big deal to me. So that set me off on a few months, really, of then just cognitively, nothing deep, just trying to figure out what I was going to do. And I came to realize that I think, actually, it's important that I'm just honest. And I'm, many, much of my school, the school that I run, the seniors that have worked with me for years, I haven't really spoken to them about it yet, I guess, <laughs> rather unceremoniously, quite a few of them will hear about it here on the, the podcast first. And I don't know how they receive it, because when I see them in the new year, because obviously with COVID, I haven't caught up with them in, in a while, lots of them, is I have to say to them and explain to them in more detail than I do here that, guys, like, that's done for me. I have no interest in Taoism, Buddhism, lineages, tradition, scripture. I don't, none of it's interesting to me anymore. I'm done with it. What I'm interested in is I have this path that I'm following and um, it's led me to this point and I feel it's going somewhere, whether that's right or wrong, I guess we'll find out. And I need to present what I'm doing to you in this way. Um, and if some of them like that, then they'll stay with me and many of them I expect won't like that and it will probably be difficult for them. They'll have to figure out what they're going to do and I kind of envisage a certain degree of breaking down of my school a little bit of Lotus Nigong um, and I'm okay with that because I think some people want that tradition and they want that lineage and they want that purity but it's just not who I am anymore. I provided that to people for 20 years pretty much of Lotus Nigong. I mean I was teaching at the same time I was traveling in Asia and I always presented things in traditional the way as I possibly could to people as much as I could through the filter of being an Englishman you know not being a, a, a Chinese born and bred, you know, so it was always a little bit of a cultural filter, but presenting as pure as I could. But I can't do that anymore, and I don't want to. So <laughs> that's that. As spoiled as that sound, I don't want to. So I think that increasingly, the methods for me are not changed. The methods are not changed. So some people won't even understand what I'm talking about, because if you're teaching the same thing, what's the difference? I'll be teaching the same exercise, the same practice, the same way of working, because those things to me are the things that worked. But the cultural baggage is what I will be stripping away from what I'm doing, so that increasingly it could be linguistically neutral. It's irrelevant as to where it came from. And I don't feel any particular loyalty to a particular lineage or branch. I feel a great loyalty and love for the people who taught me. But thankfully the teachers I have now are also in a similar place where they're kind of stepping out of traditions too. I believe that the traditions were needed for me. I believe they were. It's not like you could start in the middle of nowhere and, you know, get any good results. They had to formulate who I was. I had to be very black and white and very dogmatic for a long time because that's my nature. My nature is to be very chaotic and blah, I'm an extrovert and I'm an outgoing, you know, there's energy all over the place. That's who I am. I'm ADHD on steroids is my natural way of being. So I had to kind of temper that, learn the rigorous discipline from the Japanese arts and then the formality of Chinese tradition and lineage to formulate who I was. But then at the same time, it gets to a point where it's just a block, like it's a block for me. It's a prison. 
and I feel like I need to step out of that or I have stepped out of that whether I wanted not or not I was kind of kicked out of it by my own practice and that's really what I have to teach so it still means that I'll be aiming to teach the formality and the discipline to the people coming up through these arts especially the younger ones um, but it will be presented from me in a far more practical and tradition and exercise based way rather than worried about lineage traditions and things like this. Now I'm aware that this is kind of controversial. It's not to me. To me it's no big deal. It's like this is what I'm doing. I don't know why that's sort of, but I know that it's a controversial topic and some people will have a, they'll have their opinions on it like they do and that's okay. And I am finding that increasingly as I speak about these things I'm receiving more vitriol, I think is the correct word, from people involved in very strict lineages. So I am seeing especially from the Taoist schools, the ones that have the priests and the robes and the scripture and the morning recitations and, you know, <laughs> all that kind of stuff that I've always found a little bit silly. I am receiving more vitriol and attacks from them. And that's okay. I don't mind. That's all right. Um, because if I were to retort to some extent, I would say that I don't think I've ever met anyone from any of those kind of backgrounds that has anything of value or that I want or that I find admirable or inspiring within them as people or as practitioners. Now I know that's a really harsh thing to say, but I think let's be honest, right? In life, if you have a fairly acute sense of discernment, shall we say, which is a polite way of saying picky, isn't it? <laughs> if you have a, if you're picky in nature, I think in life you do find very few people that you find really inspiring. I think I find people that have inspiring things in them. I can see that in strangers and that's very clever. Wow, that's quite a skill. That's a nice character trait. That's a very kind thing you've done. Those kind of things I found out. But there's very few people that I could actually go, okay, that person there I find highly inspiring. There is something in that person that I recognize as truth and magical and something that I want to orientate myself towards. And that's really what it comes down to. If someone is inspiring, I allow them to inspire me. I move in that direction. And I meet few of those people that are truly up there, you know. So when I do meet those people, that's what I'm interested in. Now, having been around many of the very dogmatic religions and traditions, I haven't found anyone that really inspires me. I found them with inspiring character traits, sometimes admirable perhaps, but none of them have really boom, blown my mind with who they are. But yet, some of the people I have met who do do that for me, that I'm like, okay, you've done well. <laughs> I am in admiration. I'm not within those traditions. Often they've had training within them, but they don't exist within them. And one thing I find universally is they also speak in the, I wouldn't say in the negative, maybe in a critical light towards the people caught up in that dogma as well. So that's where I find myself um, at the moment. I don't know how it will go. I'm sure that some of the people I teach won't even notice, to be perfectly honest. They're still doing the exercises, they're still doing the training, but I feel the difference. I feel a liberation from those traditions. It's a funny thing, isn't it? It's like you, when you start out, you have to find lineage, functional lineage in these arts. And okay, that's useful because it means you're studying something that's not made up or wedged together. But there's also an egotistical side to it where you want almost like a CV or a, you know, like a, <laughs> a, a, a training history that's behind you that people reading are, wow, that's impressive. It's like some kind of name dropping. And that becomes a form of chasing for the wrong thing. So you end up chasing the trimmings rather than the core. And I think that as these things have all broken down, my obsession or worry about my CV, my CV for want of a better term, whatever you want to call it, my bio, has broken down. Now that being said, my CV and my training bio is actually very, very good. If you were to objectively place it next to other people's, it would be pretty good. It would be better than most, even though I get attacked for that weirdly. People are just negative on the internet. But it's pretty good, but I don't care. It's not something that I'm enamored with anymore. What I'm interested in is to simply keep exploring and keep working on my personal development and a connection to what, for want of a better term, I can entitle my soul. And I know the Buddhists are probably cringing hearing that, but that's really where I'm at. And that's where my mind is at. 
the exploration and connection to the soul. That's really what interests me. And I believe that the traditions are a problem in this, that they don't help. I think the traditions can train the mind, the most transient part of who we are. They can train the body, fair enough. They can train the energy, but I believe they lack what is needed to connect a person to their soul. Because I think for everything that we do in the art, there is an outcome, and then there is an antithesis to this outcome. And the dogma of a strict tradition is the antithesis to truly finding your soul. So that's where I sit with it at the moment. So apologies if that's just a, I don't know, an overly personal and slightly vague <laughs> rant or talk. But it's just where I'm at right now. And I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to convert anybody else to anything. If you want to study to be a priest, study to be a priest. If you want to study to be a tea drinker, study to be a tea drinker. I don't care. Whatever you want to do. But know that this is where I'm at. So anybody that is going to wish to come and learn off me, that's what's going to happen. That's what you're going to get. And if that doesn't suit you, then I'm not the person to train with, really. I'm really not. Because you will find me lacking or frustrating with that particular region of study. Other than that, I just wanted to introduce you to the podcast studio, which I can, I'm sure you will agree, demonstrates an exquisite level of taste that borders on tasteless, <laughs> perhaps, um, and show you where it is and just kind of say that we're getting things up and running and apologies for the poor lighting. We haven't quite got that right yet. And the sound equipment is still in the post because things can take a little while to arrive in the jungle. Um, so the first few episodes will be a little bit like this, a bit amateurish where they're just <laughs> the best we could do. And I, but I was going to wait until the new year to start the podcast, but I had some great guests here. My friend Asa, my friend Adam Meisner happened to be here for a month with me in, in Bali. So it made sense to record those podcasts while they were there, even though we didn't have the full equipment. So hopefully you'll forgive me for the amateurishness. I will put these few episodes up and then there'll probably be a little bit of a gap while I'm back in Europe. And then in the new year, probably at the end of January, we will start the podcast properly with all of the equipment that we require. Um, and then we shall almost be professional. We'll see. Thanks very much, guys. Hope you have a good Christmas. Please do indulge. Go for it. And then that will give you a challenge in January to try and fix all the damage you've done. Happy Christmas, guys.